Well, I've been in deep prayer about this. And uh, God was showing me, he's like, so what do I talk about? What do you want to say? Because people don't know who they are. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't have any idea. I said, really? Okay. Where do I begin with that? Well, I labored all week and taught that everything else. I normally get the sermon on Tuesday, Wednesday. That was a game time decision before this one fucking came together. I don't know where this is going to go today. I, where it even went this morning was crazy. So, whatever comes out of my mouth, <laughs> I don't know. But here's what I'm going to say. Do you have an identity crisis? Do you really have any idea who you really are? Or did somebody else mold that? Did somebody else tell you who they thought you were supposed to be? But that's not who you are. Do we have an understanding of who we are with God? Where do we stand with God? And so this series, not I always going to go on for, but the series is called Identity Crisis. And it's saying, find my identity in Christ. I went to church for a long time when I was a kid. Nobody ever told me this. Nobody ever said a word about what my identity was in Christ. I don't know you, but I never heard. So, next slide. Um, so this, uh, this sermon is called, It's a Conspiracy. And of course, this is a picture of our late president, John F. Kennedy, right here, and his wife, for that, fa that fateful moment when bullets shattered his head and the other in the, in the neck. There are so many conspiracies, theories about this incident that still go on. They still go on to this day. Of what I've seen of it, not that I'm a deep studier in this, but it was pretty simple when you saw the Zabruder film and saw that one time he went like this because he got nailed in the neck and the throat. And then the next shot, boom, you can see it right there. The Warren Commission said it was a one single bullet theory where it went here, 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 here in one shot. And over and over again, people were dispelling that. But here's the thing the big question, new slide. What if everything you've ever been told in life is a lie? That's a deep one. I got the same reaction this morning, too. I had a whole bunch of elderly people look at me and went, what? I said, don't stone me. Okay, I know you, I know you stoned Stephen. I know I got the name. Don't stone me. This question is a challenging question because all our lives we've been told that. We've been, we've been specifically told things to do this, do that. From the time that we come out of the womb and the time we start absorbing right from wrong, we've been told that whatever that is, is what we learn. But what if it's not true? What if everything that you learned was a lie? It's deep, right? You go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I can go back to the womb. Give me. Um, we're gonna we're gonna play a clip surely from uh, the Matrix movie back from 1999. I don't know why God was allowing me to go back to this point, but the bottom line is when I start looking at that movie again, I'm going, yo. There were times in our in, in my life where I was told things that were not true. You go get the next clip, son. Ah, look at that. Isn't that a scary funny? And I had a couple relatives who could pay us for that. So, um, Santa Claus. When I was when I found out that Santa Claus was real, I was like, "Is it real?" Yeah. It was like my world came coming down. Easter Bunny wasn't as big a deal. It was chocolate, and that was about it. But but Santa Claus, Santa. Like the elf, Santa, you know, um, and, and 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 you know to find out that he wasn't real, that the magical cookies just ate themselves the next day and everything. Think about this. That's what a lot of people do to their kids. 
No, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I'm saying it's a little sandy game in the Easter game, right? And the Easter bunny. Then they get to a certain age and they're told, oh, by the way, that's not true. But then we tell them about Jesus and expect them to believe Jesus. When we've already set the tempo of saying, well, this isn't, this isn't true, this isn't true. So now is Jesus real? Now, again, I'm not going to get into the debate of whether you, tell, you celebrate Christmas in that way or not, or Easter. I'm not going to get into that old Christian debate that this is evil and Halloween's the devil's holiday. I'm not going to go down that road, okay? I'm just talking about the precedent that we're setting here. We were told one thing, and then we found out reality that wasn't true. Okay? So, next slide, son. School. The history of schools is deep. But I'm just going to give you this little paragraph here. The first American schools in the 13 original colonies opened in the 17th century. It was a Latin school that was founded in 1635. Is both the first public school and oldest existing school in the United States. The first tax supported public school was open uh, in Massachusetts in 1644 and it was run by a reverend. Right. So the colonists tried to, at first to educate by the traditional English methods of family, church, community, and apprenticeship, with schools later becoming the key agent in socialization. So notice what it started off with church. Ruh -ruh. Family, church, community, and apprenticeship. It didn't talk about arithmetic, writing, and reading. Right? It told them about how to be productive in society and told them about their purpose. But then it, later on, it says, says here that at first the, the rudiments of literacy and arithmetic were taught inside the family, assuming the parents had their skills. Literate literacy rates were much higher in New England, much lower in the South. What I needed to put in here was it was primarily rich white males that would be educated. And very few females would step into that realm. And let alone in the South, especially if you were, you know, a slave and so forth, forget it. So it says by the mid-19th century, the roles of the schools had expanded to such an extent that many of the educational tasks, traditionally handled by, handled by parents, became the responsibility of the schools. I think about where we are, where we once were, when this building was Wheaton Industries. And this was one of the biggest games in town. This company put glass, I believe, on the map worldwide. And people were trained in school to work in factories. How do we know that? What happened when you got into school? You went to your locker, you got your stuff, Bing, bell rang. Where do you go from there? Oh, I gotta go to class. They're training you. Yeah, sometimes. And, and so all of a sudden the bell rings and you go to a class. You sit in a classroom and they and they say, Good morning, class. What do you say? Say, you've been trained. They trained you. And then what happens after the class is over? Bing! Bell rings. Got to go to another class. This was done on purpose. And so what they did was over time, they trained you on what they wanted you to be. The Industrial Revolution for 150 years worked that way. And for a lot of time, the middle class actually benefited from it because they had good paying jobs if they worked in the factories. But you were told what to do. You were a, a cog in the wheel that basically moved everything forward. Now all of a sudden, the Industrial Revolution is over. And people are wondering, what's now? What's next? Do we ever think about changing something called our paradigm, which means our world, where we think things are versus what they really are? I'm, it's going to be a challenge for all of us today to think about if you were to unload your mind and totally like erase the whiteboard to start over. How would God feel? It's, oh, this is deep. I know. It's going to take some time to settle, okay? Next slide. Ten things not taught in public schools. Number one, what's my purpose in life? If, if, if this goes on, first of all, I ask my son, because if they tell him that, then I'm wrong. But I never heard this in school. I never heard. I never learned speed reading, which I could really use right now in confession on it. 
And an ADD thing where you start reading the same sentence five times and you're like, all right, I've got to read it again, I've got to read it again, yeah? And time management techniques, never learn it. How do you manage time? That's one of the most important things in life, isn't it? Time and money. Study skills. They tell you to study, but they don't teach you how. Right? Basic money management. Oh, there's a pet peeve of mine. So you're supposed to go out into the world and learn how to use money, but they didn't teach you. You get this, guys? Kind of weird, huh? Survival skills. That's another good one. Okay, if this whole thing started shaking and going, going forward, uh, maybe one or two of you know what to do. I, I'm going to pray and ask Jesus to save me. Save us, because I don't know. A lot of people don't know. They don't know survival skills. If we all of a sudden lost electricity for months at a time, do you know how to survive? I don't. They didn't teach me that. And that could happen. Negotiation skills, that's a great one, especially for married couples. But even so, if you're in business or whatever, there's some negotiation. I mean, I used to get my tail handed to me going to a car dealership. They'd see me coming a mile away, I was like, oh, this is payday, man, here he comes. I'm like, da, 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 da. come marking on in with a big target on my back going, hi right, guys, I want to pay over your sticker price. Please, and they're all like crowding toward me like, yeah, we'll take care of it. No, we'll take care of it. The salesmen are fighting over me, yeah. All why? Because I didn't learn negotiation skills. Basic self-defense. If somebody approaches you and with a weapon or so forth, you know how to defend yourself? Or do you go to karate school on your own? Yeah. Why couldn't we as a society learn those skills? The Japanese do. They had a society where at one point they couldn't have any weapons. Mental health, there's a great one. How many people suffer from depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and so forth? How do you deal with that? Nobody home. Chirp, 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 chirp. Didn't teach it. How to apply for an interview for a job. You're training people to go into the community, you'll get work, and you're not telling them what to do. Oh, I guess you got to go to college to learn that. Well, they don't teach that in there either. Isn't this amazing? Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right? There's no coffee in me. This is pure Holy Spirit, okay? I'm thinking about this. I'm going, wait a minute. I've been programmed, and none of this stuff that I need to be programmed with came in the program. Next slide, son. But the two th biggest things not taught is politics and religion. Three of you guys are the characters. <laughs> I'm getting in trouble. I'm going around. I'm going around to everybody. I'm going. Bill's going to build a wall, and Biden's going to pay for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. I need Jesus. Anyway, so, but these are the two biggest things. Don't you guys hear this all the time? Don't talk about politics or religion. Why not? These are the two biggest things in life. Politics involves the way we live as a society. And religion is our faith. And if we're not engaging people in faith because we're told not to say anything, even if other people said, look, I choose another religion, they have a choice to make. God gives them a choice. But where's the, where's the dialogue? Right? So, next slide. Hold on, we'll go back on. This is a scene from The Matrix, the movie. Reality versus fantasy. Two questions that we're asking here were phenomenal. What is real and how do you define real? This particular movie, this man realizes that he's caught that the world is actually a computer program, that everything that he sees is not real. And then he's shown what reality is. Why am I showing you this? I want you to understand something as we go in the sermon. When Adam and Eve fell and sin was brought into the world, Satan was given the keys to the kingdom of the earth. We are living under a different government. But most people won't understand that. They don't understand the system that we have 
even as a quote unquote free country, spiritually, it's a prison. So I'm going to play this video for you. Like, please. <laughs> oh, look at that. You sent your husband to do it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> This is the construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. something to fill the void. Now, it doesn't mean Disney's evil. 
But what it does mean is, I saw what they portrayed as reality. And if you've ever been to Disney World, they only have one clock in the entire amusement park for each one. One. They don't want you to look at time. They take you into a, a place where it's removed from all the big city stuff, and everything has this facade to it. Fast forward to 2004, I got saved. And we went back. And I thought I was having the most miserable time. Because all of a sudden I realized, this isn't real. Now I know it's not real. But I mean real in my spirit that that was going to feed the hole in my heart. That was what I was going to lean on. And all of a sudden it was gone. And when you saw what Keanu Reeves did, Neo, and he said, no, 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 that was me. And I couldn't tell anybody that because they think I'm crazy. But you guys all know I'm crazy, so this is great. I have to share it all day long. They're like, that's hey, Steve, you know? But, but that's what happened. I, in my mind, I, 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 I flipped the switch and said, wow, th th this isn't, no. And on one of those trips, I remember they took us from, from Main Street and walked down and said, you're going to have to detour and go behind the scenes and come back out because you're having a parade. And we walked behind it. And all of a sudden, you saw this, you know, you went from beautiful Main Street, USA, and you saw this ugly machinery behind it that was doing all the work and everything to make it look good there. Are you guys following me? It's deep. It's deep. But the reality was, I was so disappointed because I saw the reality in it. That's what God does with us. See, on the outside, we can look great, can't we? But on the inside, reality's there. We're a mess. We need Him. Without Him, we can't do it. Some people use a sermon to justify their position that either there is no God or that Jesus is God. And I get it. Because if you study church history, it is ugly. Who decided to make the rules of what book went in and what didn't? What happened with the popes, the Catholic Church? What happened between uh, uh, Martin Luther and the Catholic Church? There's some ugly stuff. And a lot of times when we, we grow up and go into church, we're told to go, do your duty, be a good person, and everything will be fine. That couldn't be further from the truth. See what I mean? It just challenged our paradigm. Because God's looking at the heart. And in all this, I had to, I had to actually, when I was doing the sermon, I had to literally, it's like staring at that white wall and just going, okay, I've got to block out everything that I've ever learned and start over. He's got to reprogram me. And faith is kind of crazy when you think about it. To all of a sudden live in a, in a scary world, if you would, of stepping out in faith, of things you can't see. Think about this, guys. We're coming together here today to worship a God we can't see, to read a book that was put together thousands of years ago that we weren't there to witness, to a Jesus that walked the earth we never saw. But yet we proclaim it all the time. Isn't it crazy? But yet it's cool. Because we live in a different world than the rest of the world does. At least we should. We're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Everything that we've learned in paradigms, even, even in some things we've learned in church, I had to challenge myself with to say, is that just because everything everybody else did it? It's kind of like, you know, when, when you, you know, talk to the churches around here, most of them start in the morning. The majority of them do. They all have the worship team. They all have this and that. Well, who says you have to have all that? We start at 2 o'clock. I don't know, man. Who says that you have to follow that rule? Let's point it back to everybody here. Who told you, who said that you must live your life this way? When God says, I want you to live this way. Who told you that? 
Where did you buy into that lie? Now, some people will say religion is a form of control, which I understand why, because it has been abused that way. So therefore, they say, listen, don't go along with that whole thing. That's nothing but a lie. But I'm here to tell you, when I questioned the Bible years ago, God showed me personally and said, that book has never failed you. He has shown me miracles in my life, in my family's life, and what he's doing here to say there is no denying this isn't a fluke. It isn't a fluke. This is all happening not because I'm a good enough presenter and people just come to hear me speak. No. Better not be. I'm not that good, trust me. But because of a living God that is showing us, that is pulling people together, because the reality is what we've learned all our lives, God says, I'm going to replace that with my word. You're not just another person in a factory. You are part of God's family if you believe in Christ. You mean something to me. You're not just another cog in the wheel. I have a plan and purpose for you. There are things that I want to do in your life. You believe it. Thanks for me. Satan is false. That doesn't mean he doesn't exist. But Jesus is truth. John 8, 44. You can turn there in your Bibles or in your phones. Or you can just follow along with me. But this is what it says. Jesus is talking to the priest, by the way. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and father of lies. Satan is also called the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2. 2. He is the god of this world in John 12, 31. These titles and many more signify Satan's capabilities. To say, for example, that Satan is the power, the prince of the power of the air is to signify that in some way he rules over the world and the people in it. But people don't really acknowledge him because they just think he's a little guy with a pitchfork. But what they don't understand is he's already gone. The phrase God of this world or God of this age indicates that Satan is a major influence on the, on the ideals, opinions, goals, hopes, and views of the majority of people. His influence also encompasses the world's philosophies, education, and commerce. The thoughts, ideas, speculation, and false religions of the world are under his control and have sprung from his lies and deception. There's an enemy ruling the show. It's the world we live in. And everything you see in pop culture, ask yourself, does it glorify God? No. The things that are being taught in schools, the things that are being that are being pushed on people, and by the time the kids get to college, they're pretty much, quote unquote, deprogrammed to become an atheist. Most people lose their faith around between the 18 and 28 year mark. They grow up in church and then they leave. And then their parents pay for school to pay for them to be deprogrammed, if you would, to believe there's no God. Then they go back out and try to figure it out and repeat process. Hence the definition of insanity, which is. I hope everybody heard Mary, but you're right. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Next slide, son. What is truth? The Bible mentions the word truth approximately 137 times. John 8, 32, it says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's a section here where Pontius Pilate is the governor, the Roman governor, that is putting Jesus on trial. And we're going to pick it up in John chapter 18, if you want to follow along there. Pilate then went back into his, inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed over you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king, then, said Pilate. 
Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the, well, two people, to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against them. Truth was staring Pilate right in the face and he didn't even know it. Isn't that cool? It was staring him right in the face and he's asking the question, what is truth? Have you ever stepped out of your comfort zone and just kind of like challenged yourself to say, is the Bible true? Is my faith true? Don't be scared. Because it is true. But you have to do the homework. God has to walk with you through it to show you his truth. But he is truth. And the truth will set you free. Everything that we have learned in life, if we have not learned about the truth, about the absolute truth that he is, it's a lie. And you may have had great parents that have brought you up in good morals and everything else, but if they didn't tell you the truth, they lied. I, I'm just speaking now. I don't know the words coming up right. I have no idea. But all I know is, I wish my mom was promoting gospel bands when I was five years old at Central Baptist. And I really, really wish that she explained this to me. Because you know what I heard? God is good. And all the time, that's programming, right? But then I go home and I see physical abuse. So wait a minute, you're trying to tell me, on the one hand, that God is good all the time, all the time God is good, and I go home and I see my mom getting the crap beat out. Explain that one to me. Is the Bible true now? But how do I know? Because nobody showed me. I tried to read it. I tried to figure it out. The day and out thing just didn't work for me. So I went and did it on my own. As Frank Sinatra used to say, I did it my way. I'm here to tell you guys, truth was staring him in the face and he still asked the question. Have you challenged yourself to say, maybe I need a fresh start? Maybe God needs to hit the reset button in my heart and in my mind to say, I think today needs to be a new day. I think I need to start over. Who are you, God? Who am I? Because some of you have been told all your life that you'll never amount to anything. Maybe you were physically abused. Maybe you've been told over and over again that because of the abuse, it was your fault. Maybe it was you were left for dead. Or you were physically constantly abused in, in a way where you know it was abusive with just constant strikes or whatever. Mental abuse. Whatever it may be, and you were bought into the lie that you are that. You're not. But you've been programmed to believe it from the abuser. You've been programmed to see it to wake you up. You've been programmed to see it and understand it and say, I own that. That's me. That's not you. Maybe you served in the military and what you've seen has identified you now. That you feel that you cause things, or you've seen tragic things happen to you, and you feel it's your fault. That's not of God. I don't know about you, but God's challenging me right now in my life to take a whiteboard and erase it and start over. Everything that I've learned in my life, I am now going back to and saying, nope, 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 uh-uh. Ain't happening. Yes. Nope. Nope. Not going to do it. Never going to do it. Go to hell. Never going to happen. Not going to do it. Because I've had people tell me, whether they do it or not, that this is the way I was supposed to be. This is who you are. This is what you're going to do. And that's it. And God completely blew that out of, out of the water and said, nope. I'm going to dictate what you do. You follow me. You follow me and start doing something new. And every time that I get in my little way about running the church, and I'm like, well, it's just got to be, 
My group tells me, really? You keep, you keep trying to do what other people are doing, but you're a unique work. Unique doesn't follow. Unique leads. You hear me back there in the cheap seats? Yeah! That's what I'm talking about. We lead. We lead. Think differently. Challenge things. Challenge yourself. And some things that you're harboring in your heart and your mind that you just bought into the lie. And God's saying, I'm here to free you of it. Why are you still buying into it? Don't have to. Not necessary. I, I told my, my, my spirit is now settled that I'm going to release things to him. But my body hasn't caught up with it yet. So at night sometimes I shake. Never happened to me before. I shake in anxiety. My spirit now is like this. My body didn't get the memo. So yesterday, my stomach is hurting because I'm blowing up looking like I'm nine months pregnant. Why? Because my body hasn't caught the signal yet that it's okay. You don't have to worry. I learned this from my mother. I love my mom dearly. But I, love, I learned this from her because when we were young and she was a single mom, she was fearful of for her life. I was fearful because she was fearful of her life. And everything I did, my mom would say, now wait a minute, before you do that, before you do that, and that's what I learned. So everything was, do that, you might do, don't do this, and that's what I would learn. So all my life, I backtracked. God would say, go ahead and do it, I'm like, okay, okay, whoa, I hear mom's voice. I don't know about that. That's kind of not a you know, comfort zone. I gotta, I, that's what I've learned from the past. And now I've got to walk it back a little bit. That's not faith. But because I heard the voice and I haven't deprogrammed of it, I'm still following it. I don't know if this message is going to make any sense to anybody. All I know is I had to say it. If, if, if anything, if you're going to get anything else out of this, take a whiteboard in your mind and wipe it clean. Start over. The older you get, the harder this is, though. Because you've learned things, it's been ingrained in you for so long. But God can do anything. He can take that whiteboard with you and say, Grace, let's start a new work. If you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the old is past, you could become a new creation. And in spirit, that's what's happened. But it doesn't unlock your mind for all the things that you've experienced. You've got to unwind that now. You gotta work through it. Are you guys with me? Yes. <laughs> Key points. There is absolute truth. His name is Jesus Christ. Be in the world, but not of it. That means you're here physically, but you don't have to participate in the things that the world's doing and saying, come on, just do. Smoke this, drink that, do this. You don't have to do that. Peer pressure is amazing. It even happens in church. Where everybody just does one thing. It's like, oh, you didn't do that? No, I'm not. You know, my stepfather, he told me that. My mom and my, my dad were always about going along with the flow and don't, don't ruffle any feathers. And he was like, the heck with that. And thank God he was in my life because he taught me that. You don't have to go along with the program. It doesn't mean you have to be rebellious 24-7, but you don't have to go along with it just because everybody else is doing it. I said my son all the time, I said, if everybody's jumping on a bridge, you can go with them. But that's what we do. Without truth, everything else is a lie. People will think you're an alien on this planet if you don't are, are truly living in the truth. What makes us stand out? What makes us stand out about living our faith? And you know something? The more heavenly minded we are, and the less earthly minded we are, the better. That's a hard one for me. I like stuff. Don't you? I like stuff. I like my drum set. I like my pool table. Don't you judge me, Brian? <laughs> I, I, I like stuff. But guess what? When I die, that stuff won't go with me. It'll go with me. It does not go with me. 
I just did a funeral earlier in the week for a childhood friend who was the same age as me. And I hadn't seen him in years. He took a, well, I guess an aspirin or something and had an allergic reaction to it. It's actually a disease. It's like a syndrome or something. There you go. And it actually ate through his skin and killed him. His mother said something profound to me. She said, I sent him off to Oregon only for the post office to bring him back in a box. I, I couldn't speak. They cremated him. And if we don't have any truth in our life, then we have no way of knowing where our ship is going. We're just tossed like waves in, 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 in the wind. But if we have a compass that's pointing us to where we need to be, we know that that compass is going to point us to victory. It's going to point us to victory. But if we don't have a compass and that ship is just getting blown all over the place, what is truth, as Pilate said? What is real and what is it? I think the Matrix movies have got a little bit of language in it. Might have some suggestive stuff, but I really don't highly recommend you watch it. Because it really blew me away on what this guy was fighting inside this matrix. And if it wasn't the Bible on screen, I know it wasn't meant to be that way. It was amazing. And as I'm watching it, when he said, What is real? What is real? That just blew me away. Test everything against the Word of God to see if it's true. If you don't tend to put it up against the word, then how do you know it's true? Somebody tells you something, you've got to go back to the word all the time. Are you going to be right on everything? No. Nope. But at the same time, God gives us his book to test it and say, these are the things that you can do to test to see if it's true or not. We are sojourners. We're here one day and gone the next. I, I um, when I was preaching this morning, I thought the people were probably going to stone me to death and I never want to see me again. And I couldn't believe, I said to Anna Maria, I said, I could not believe the people that came up to me afterwards and said, I've never heard that before. I haven't heard that in years. And a lot of them are eloquent. And they were right with me even about the Disney World part. But you know, it's cold. I told him, I said, you're not done until your final breath is taken. And whether you're elderly or not, the, the same rule applies all the way across the board. God can take any of us at any given time. There is no, well, once you get to 80, then you got to start making arrangements. No. John Pennington was 46 years old. I'm going to be 46 in August. He's gone. I've done funerals for a four-year-old that drowned. I've done funerals for premature babies that never made it out of the womb. I've done funerals for a 30 year old. It's all over the map. But here's what I'm going to say to wrap it up. God isn't scared if you test him, if you challenge him, not in a, in a disrespectful way, but walking with him and asking Daddy the questions. We got this thing where we believe that if we ask God a question, but he's going to strike us over. That's not true. How in the world do you ask God if you throw in your feet and you'll talk to your heavenly dad? You can ask the questions. It's a position of the heart, but you can ask the questions. Why not? Because we've been told not to. Read the word and see how many people ask. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be studying the, 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 the gentleman named Gideon story of a guy named Gideon. He was told one thing and didn't believe it. And he questioned God a lot. And God didn't wait to walk the face of the earth. He talked to him. Is he talking to you today? Do you know that you can know Jesus right where you are? That you, you, you don't need a magical formula to get there. Guys, this church is forming and it continues to form because of God, not me. He's bringing the people. He's bringing the resource. He's putting us in positions that, that we haven't seen nothing yet. 
Nothing. This is just a warm-up. And I'm here to tell you that in this group right now, in this day, you right now can have a relationship with Jesus, and your life can change to then change for others that are going to come through this door and others that he's going to put you with. The question is, do you want to go on that journey? What train do you want to be on? The northern mail or the southern mail? Take the whiteboard and clear your mind and start over. All the things that you've learned start from the beginning. Go back in your mind. Is this really true about me, God? No, it is not, my word says. Is this true about me, God? No, it isn't, my word says. Is this what you want me to do? Yes, it is. Okay. It's the only way that we're going to be able to move forward as a society. We have to be honest with one another. We have to be honest with ourselves, with God, to say, Lord, work on me. Make me new. Take the whiteboard and wipe it away. Start over. We are in a spiritual battle, guys. A spiritual battle. There are things that are going on all around us that we can't see. It's happening. That we're going to fight for. People are fighting over us. And when you saw that, that area where those gentlemen were talking and it was white, it's just, we can create anything. We need to create a new reality for ourselves to know that we are blood bought by Jesus Christ. We are the head and not the tail. We are part of a royal priesthood for those who know Jesus. That we will rule and reign with him one day. That he died for us. He went on a cross so we could live. So we have to understand that if he is our blood, that blood bought by him, he went to the cross for us, we're his responsibility. Which means that when we think he's left us, he hasn't. Which means that he died so we could live. And if you will not hear anything else, right here, right now, God is saying, I love you. Don't worry about your past. Your past is gone. In Jesus' name. I'm going to make your past a wonderful future. It's time to start. It's time to get the whiteboard and wipe it clean. And I'm going to use your past to make an amazing but you're not going to live in it anymore. Do you guys really want to live in your past? I know I don't. Sometimes I get in that mode where I want to. Like, why in the world would I want to do that? I want to be better. You guys want to be better? Yeah. So if you don't know Jesus, you've never heard the gospel before, the good news, here it is, simple. It's as simple as ABC. A, you've got to admit the truth about yourself. That your sin separates you from the Holy God. You've got to come to grips with the fact that you're not perfect. And B, you've got to believe that God did something the problem because he put us in it. But we can't get out of it ourselves. Only God can save us. He designed it that way. That's where it's at. So we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And in C, we commit we commit our lives to following him all the days of our lives. And then we've got a slide of D in there saying, do it today, you just don't know. When your last breath we did. Guys, he loves you. He loves you. All the things that you battle, all the things you're still battling, all the things you're going through, you mean the world to him. He's going to take it, he's going to take you through it. It ain't going to be easy. You're going to have to go through some stuff to get there. But the bottom line is, he's going to take you through it. He's going to make you better than you can ever imagine. It's one heck of a journey. But are you willing to die to yourself and live more for him? Are you willing to sacrifice along the way? Are you willing to give your time, talent, and treasure for his kingdom? Are you willing to humble yourself and listen to what he's trying to say? These are all questions I wrestle with every day. So don't think I'm pointing it at you. Okay? So let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, and praise you, God, for this day you've made, Lord. It's an amazing day. God, I want to thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit being in here and moving in people. I don't know if anything connected here today or not. I don't know. But I do know, Lord, that you have a love for us. You want us, Lord, to have a fresh and clear mind, clear heart to follow you. And all the things we've learned in life, Lord, that maybe were not of you, God, I pray that you heal us of it and move us forward out of it. To remember it, but not to live in it. God, I just pray in Jesus' name that anybody that doesn't know you, they can pray along with me like this. They can say, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I'm a sinner. I know it. I admit it. But I believe that Jesus died and paid the price for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and give you my life today. Okay, guys, listen. Um, over here on my left is what we call the war room. Okay? This is a place of prayer. If anybody wants to come up and pray here, uh, we'll have some we'll call prayer warriors will be lined up here. And they have some oil and so forth to help you with. Um, if you are not there for that, and the social time is going to be through the double doors, I'm going to ask that you take the talk and everything through the doors. We get snacks and stuff out there. We're happy to talk to you and say hi. But let's connect as a church. And I want to thank you guys. Love you all. God bless you. Thank you.